Hello and welcome to this cartilage repair symposium at the California Orthopedic Association. This session is sponsored by Vericell. I'm Dr. Seth Sherman from Stanford University and we have a really exciting program slotted for you over the next hour. First, I'm going to give a short talk on Macy implantation and the innovations that we've learned over the last several years in the United States. And then I'm gonna introduce colleagues from around the country and we're really going to um, talk about cartilage repair for the femoral condyles, a case-based and lively discussion. All of my disclosures are available uh, online. When we look at the overall cartilage repair landscape, and we're talking about things such as Macy, we're really talking about the opportunity to create highland-like or even highland cartilage. Unfortunately, as you see on this graph, this often comes at a relative cost as sometimes the surgeries or the indications are more difficult, procedures are more expensive, and it often requires more than one procedure to get the job done for our patients. When we look at treatment options, it can become really overwhelming and confusing. But when you boil it down, there's really limited options for knee cartilage when we're talking about large defects, multifocal lesions, or lesions of the patellofemoral joint. Really, MACI or ACI and osteochondroallografts are the two mainstays. We just published this article and presented it at different meetings, um, looking at um, stratifying the cartilage procedures by FDA regulatory pathways. And the bottom line, if you're looking for preclinical and clinical evidence supporting use, really look no further than MACI, as you see on the far left, and osteochondral allograft. You can see that there are many other products on the market, but they really don't have the longstanding track record, uh, either preclinical or clinical, to stand up uh, to these um, treatments, which are typically what we would use for the largest and multifocal uh, defects. Macy's been around for a long time. You can see the timeline of autologous chondrocyte implantation dating back to the mid 90s. That's almost 30 year track record, um, a lot of which transitioned from overseas, uh, but it's been very exciting with the uh, FDA approval uh, of the third generation uh, technique uh, just a few years ago. Clearly this leads to being time tested um, and uh, you know, we've come a long way uh, in experience and knowledge as you hear from my co-presenters today uh, from the initial experiences and the learning curve for uh, those giants in our fields like Dr. Britberg and Lars Peterson. Macy is bone stock preserving. It does not burn bridges for other procedures that are either surface or deeper than the surface. It does produce highland light cartilage which is a pro if you compare it to the fiber cartilage of microfracture, but it's a con if you're comparing it um, head to head at time zero to osteochondral allograft. It is two stage, but as we'll discuss in the cases, really most cartilage procedures, particularly for large multifocal or complex uh, defects are two stage. First a staging arthroscopy, then coming back, treating things such as alignment, meniscus and others uh, concomitantly or in those different stages. We take a biopsy, we then send it to the laboratory for processing, and then we come back in stage two for implantation. Um, there's been a wrap that Macy is expensive. Um, I would say that this is also true when compared to the other procedures. However, um, the insurance uh, companies based on the long track record and evidence uh, have uh, been uh, way um, uh, more uh, accepting of Macy for a variety of indications about the knee and it's made it a lot easier uh, to get this approved, rightfully so, and offered to our patients. There are multiple publications for large lesions and favorable clinical outcomes up to 20 years. You really won't see this with anything other than osteochondral allograft and patient satisfaction greater than 90%. This has been a workhorse for years for large femoral lesions like you see in this picture. And it's also been a workhorse for multifocal lesions which were previously off label in the second generation but now with Macy third generation are completely uh, on the label. And you can see here uh, in the older generations how time consuming tedious it was to have to suture in the Macy, uh, the ACI, excuse me, and then uh, inject the cells uh, beneath uh, the membrane. As you'll see in a moment, the techniques have very much uh, simplified uh, leading to more efficiency in the operating room in the new generation. 
Uh, patellofemoral and bipolar were also previously off the FDA label and now are completely approved. And you can see here how nicely the ACI contours to the really complex geometry of the patella and trochlea, making it quite advantageous. Looking at long-term outcomes from Sweden, several hundred patients, long-term follow-up of large defects, these are good results in 75% and 92% patient satisfaction. Looking at the Brigham and Women series, again, 75% good results for large defects, long follow-up in hundreds of patients. So third generation Macy, recently FDA approved after the summit trial, you can see where there was approved superiority versus microfracture. That was at two years. And now we've even shown extension uh, towards five years. Um, Macy's really exciting because it's the first tissue engineered autologous cellular scaffold uh, that's been approved in the United States. This basically involves characterizing your own cultured chondrocytes, so the own cartilage cells taken from a biopsy and placing them on a resorbable porcine type 1, 3 collagen membrane. There um, are many benefits to this, including uniform cell distribution, several hundred thousand to almost a million per centimeter squared. Here's a close-up of, of the Macy membrane. You can see the smooth side, which protects the cells from the joint. And then you see the rough side, which aids in um, chondrocyte uh, attachment. And the rough side is the side that goes down towards the subchondral bone. We can see on the far right what happens after implantation. Basically, these cells migrate through the membrane. They go through the fibrin glue. They begin to regenerate matrix and to create the patient's own cartilage with the patient's own cells. Each of the lots that are given have viability and screening assays. So we know the viability of the chondrocytes at time zero. Uh, we can identify what the cells are present and we know the potency. This is great information for the surgeon. This is great information uh, to confirm to our patients that these cells are in fact viable when they're being implanted. Macy, as we've talked about, has expanded our FDA label. It really is for treatment of the quote-unquote knee, which includes the femur, condyle, and trochlea. It includes the patella and the tibial plateau. We'll see the technique is technically easier. There's opportunities for accelerated rehabilitation. So not all cases are the 12 to 18 months remodeling and rehabilitation and return to activities. Uh, some we can get back safely and faster. Here's uh, from our friend Mario Havisi and the Mayo Group, a technique article that was uh, out recently. So what we can see uh, is that the new generation technique uses these custom cutters. So basically we have a guide that goes around the sides of the defect. We can really size the diameter appropriately. We wanna get to healthy adjacent cartilage. And then you can use a ring curette to debride to, but not through the subchondral bone layer. We want to get through that calcified layer down to that dull uh, subchondral bone layer. We want to get meticulous hemostasis, and we'll talk with the panel on different tips or tricks that we might be able to accomplish this. Um, and then we have the Macy uh, implant, which comes to the back table. Um, as long as the notched portion is down to the left corner, the cell sides are up. And so we use the same cutter to the same exact size. We can harvest the Macy. Uh, we can protect it for the time being uh, with the foil, uh, as you see there adjacent to the Macy. We can then uh, expose the defect through this limited arthrotomy, prepare it as we did previously, place a small um, film of fibrin glue on the bed, and then place the Macy with the cell side down, so the smooth side up. We can use some gentle finger pressure. We can make sure that the Macy is flush with the subchondral bone. We do not want it pie crusting up over the edges so that we can reduce the risk of early delamination uh, of the implant. Here we can see the final Macy. We allow the fibrin glue to set. We can place a little additional fibrin glue around the peripherally. And then um, we can range the knee and we want to range the knee to ensure that we have early um, ability to um, uh, rehabilitate uh, with CPM as we'll talk about, um, but also using gravity assisted exercises. And we want to range it and look at the Macy and prove uh, that it's stable. And in most cases, um, uh, which is uh, quite nice, uh, we certainly prove that it's stable enough for early range of motion, uh, and that way we can be confident after the surgery that we can move our patients readily.
Rehabilitation is also evolving, as we said, towards acceleration. Uh, we can only be as fast as the biology. So I always think about uh, and look at the cartoons on the right, looking at the remodeling uh, from initial implantation through the mid phases uh, until there really is cartilage uh, with a matrix that is quite mature. And that really can correlate to the different phases of kind of normalization of your daily life activities, your initial period of protection, and then transitioning towards is building strength and being active. Um, and uh, there's an entire continuum and a whole rehabilitation um, uh, protocol and booklet and guideline that you can get with your patients uh, so that you can follow suit with the best available evidence. Um, a group of us just did a, a recent um, Delphi on the rehab uh, that has been published. Uh, and so that incorporates some of the next generation uh, concepts uh, for Macy rehabilitation for different complexities of cases from the straightforward ones uh, to the more challenging and complex cases. As far as outcomes in America, we really only have early experience, but abroad, there's some with 12 year follow up. Here's 20 plus patients, significant subjective improvements. MRIs are normal to near normal in 75%. Cartlet signal did correlate to the clinical outcome uh, in this study, which is different than some other cartilage restoration uh, techniques where the fill really didn't correlate to how the patients were doing. An important point, alignment correction improves the outcome of cell-based cartilage repair. This is especially true for patella defects as you see improvements upwards of 50% uh, when you correct the malalignment. This is also true for the condyle. So um, in the medial femoral condyle, uh, ACI, 58% outcomes when it's isolated versus up to 90% success when you include osteotomy. My uh, fellows from last year looked at a, a database, 1,000 patients, cartilage restoration plus minus osteotomy, and showed that when you perform osteotomy at the time of an index, ACI or an osteochondrolograph procedure, this significantly reduces the risk of reoperation with a similar rate of complications and similar overall costs. So have a low threshold to include osteotomy. Lastly, when do I consider things like MACE or cell-based repair? For me, really symptomatic lesions of the patellofemoral joint, um, medium to large patella and trochlea, and bipolar patellofemoral defects. Multifocal lesions where I have a condyle plus the patellofemoral joint, I think is an incredible indication and rare symptomatic tibial defects are also great for cell-based repair. Small defects of the condyles and trochlea, I think we have better options such as oat autograph or now fresh pre-cut osteochondral allografts. Large solitary condyle lesions, this is really dealer's choice with the evidence based on surgeon preference and maybe some patient-specific preferences, osteochondral allograft versus Macy. Here you can see return to sport, um, and you can see for both osteochondral graft and ACI, uh, 82 to 88% uh, return to sport timeframes in the 10 to 12 month uh, range. So both can get you back to sport with a high percentage and at a reasonably fast time uh, after the procedure. I consider other options when patients are older, when they have early narrowing or osteophytes, uncontained lesions, post-traumatic, avascular necrosis, OCD, failed prior cartilage repairs. When there's a compromised bone bed like subchondral edema, cystic changes, early osteophytes and early joint space narrowing. When there's prior microfracture, three times higher failure rate with intralesional osteophytes. For those patients, we have available and readily used osteochondral allograft transplantation, as you can see in these representative pictures. And so in conclusion, there are many options for cartilage restoration, but few with both preclinical and clinical data for large lesions. Macy can be a workhorse for large lesions of the patellofemoral joint, for multifocal lesions, and for the solitary condyle. We want to think about optimizing that joint environment to maximize the chance of a good outcome. And I thank you very much uh, for your attention. And now we're excited to move forward with the next session. We're going to uh, do a case-based panel discussion on cartilage repair for the femoral condyle. Once again, we'd love to thank uh, our sponsor, uh, Vericell, for this exciting event. Uh, I'm Seth Sherman. I'm gonna continue uh, by moderating uh, this lively case panel. I'm from Stanford University.
We have panelist Michael Bamfi from the Curlin Job Institute. Hi, Mike. We have Cassandra Lee from UC Davis. And we have the one and only John Lane, uh, who's the faculty at UC San Diego. And so here's the rules of engagement. We have six cartilage repair cases presented by our three expert panelists. These cases are either slam dunk mace indication, a borderline Macy indication, or perhaps, in their opinion, a poor Macy indication. We're going to kind of guess the expected outcome, whether it worked out or whether it was an obvious failure and they should have done something different. And then, of course, the surgeon is going to tell us what they did and why and tell us uh, the actual outcome which should lead to some really fun group discussion uh, and some debate. So without further ado, I will have John Lane uh, presenting his first case, which we see here. Thank you very much, Seth. And I want to thank Vericell for allowing me to be on this great panel. Uh, the first case that I'd like to talk about is a 39-year-old female. She had fallen and struck the medial aspect of her knee uh, this was 10 months and she had persistent pain. She presented with these x-rays, which basically were within normal limits with normal joint space, no significant spurring or any other abnormalities on joint space uh, irregularity. We obtained long leg alignment films because she had ongoing symptoms, she was in neutral. Um, the MRI was obtained because of persistent symptoms, and she had a defect of the medial femoral condyle, but there was no subchondral edema. Otherwise, it was unremarkable with intact menisci. She's had no prior surgery for this. She was initially treated with significant amounts of physical therapy. We placed her in a valgus unloader knee brace and also provided her with anti-inflammatories. So because of her ongoing symptoms, and you'll note the date is May 2018, she underwent this initial diagnostic and somewhat therapeutic operative procedure. She was noted to have a medial femoral condyle grade three lesion, approximately two by one and a half centimeters on the medial femoral condyle in the central portion. Because of her ongoing complaints and the lack of any other symptoms that we can- Hold on one second, John. So let me ask uh, Michael Banfi. So you have this patient, uh, John presented. Uh, is this a slam dunk Macy case? Is this a borderline one? Is this a, a poor indication? Uh, is that your go-to for this type of a uh, defect after the, the staging scope? Well, you know, the- um... The, the, the arthroscopic pictures that we have, you know, never look as bad as they, as they did at the time of the surgery. I can tell you that for sure. You know, going back and making my own cases up, I'm like, gosh, that, it really looked worse, you know, when I, when I was there looking at it. Plus, we also know, you know, through the literature that, um, you know, we, we frequently uh, underestimate the size of the defect. So although we're, we're probing this, you know, it's, it's possible that some of that cartilage could even, um, uh, you know, uh, propagate even more and be a larger defect. So, I think this is a, a big defect, you know, um, you know, two by 1.5, I would say is a moderate defect. It's probably a little bit bigger, but it is grade three. You know, I think that uh, it sounds like she's suffered uh, for quite a long time. She has good alignment. It looks like her meniscus is intact. She's ligamentously intact. So this should be a pretty straightforward Macy, in my opinion. Excellent. And Cassandra, real quick, uh, if you did Macy on this one, uh, are you expecting a good outcome or, or are you a bit concerned? I think overall, looking at all everything that we're putting together, neutral alignment, uh, ligaments are intact. The other structures look great. So the uh, tibial plateau looks pristine. Medial meniscus looks to be intact. If it's just an isolated chondral defect, young patient, motivated, unloader brace, I think this is should have good outcomes. And just to um, bridge back to John in a minute, Cassandra. So uh, are you going right to Macy? Like you're going to the recovery room after the biopsy and you're telling them, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. We'll do it in three weeks, grow cells. Or are you seeing how they do after the scope and, and kind of biding your time going back to the unloader and biologics, et cetera? I think this is a tough question because I think a lot of this has to be laid out when you first talk to the patient. There's a reason why you're going for the diagnostic scope. Uh, diagnostic scope. So you need to kind of have you know, there's a reason why you took the biopsy. And I think there's some literature that's coming out, I think from Flanagan's group that's looking at if you delay 
if you have a chondral defect, you know about it, and you delay treatment for six months, a year, then that lesion tends to grow bigger and you potentially can have worse outcomes. If you think about it from a biologic standpoint, basically if the knee gets kind of angry, you put degradative enzymes in there, you start breaking down the rest of the cartilage. So I think in this sense, if I had gone, you know, this run about my patient, we would have talked about it and there's a reason why we did the biopsy so we would plan on proceeding. Excellent. John, go ahead, my friend. Well, I, I love Cassandra's discussion of that. And my takeoff is a little bit different because half of the ones that I biopsy, they'll ask me, doc, do I really need to have the second operation? I'm now doing fine. You stabilized my cartilage edges. So that sort of led me to, let's say, watchful waiting. So to me, it's like, okay, let's rehab you, see how you do. You can see now we're August 2020. And finally, she goes, okay, it is, it's bad enough. I really want to do it. We've uh, spent a lot of time just trying to get her through with the uh, unloader brace. So she elects to have the procedure. We have the cells prepared. Now she has a three and a half centimeter by one and a half centimeter defect, as Cassandra was noting that it, it frequently can happen. Here's the defect through our medial arthrotomy. You can see that there's a large defect and you get rid of all the viable or non-viable cartilage back to really healthy tissue. You try to get vertical edges. And so this is the size of the lesion. And now you can see the implant. There's some fibrin glue that we've yet to take off at the periphery of the implant. Uh, Post-operatively, it was interesting that she developed some atrial fibrillation, uh, had to have eloquis, which then raises the whole uh, issue of chondrotoxicity postoperatively with increased bleeding. Um, the rehabilitation is I wait till eight hours. They are immobilized in extension. They then start CPM, uh, partial weight bearing, as you can see. Uh, for a month, I start them with uh, 20 kilograms, uh, knee braced, uh, zero to 60 for two weeks. And for her, it was zero to 90 for up to four. And then they progressively transitioned to full weight bearing. And I still had her in a valgus unloader knee brace. And in fact, she still is right now. I, in fact, saw her today. How's she doing now? She's doing very well. She actually uh, says, well, I can't crawl into the trucks right yet, but I, I crawl on the ground. I look under the car. She's an estimator for a, a car repair shop. Mike Banfi, do you uh, use... A unloader brace for these patients, even when they're uh, in neutral. I typically don't. You know, I there there was a a, a cartilage brace that was kind of a, a light unloader brace that I tried for a while. Um, I just find that the compliance with the with the brace, at least in my patients, isn't great, and so I, I shied away from it. It was, it was I just didn't think that it was um, really doing all all that I wanted it to do because they weren't usually using it. Sandra, it looks like on John's protocol here that he doesn't do physical therapy early. Can you comment on that? And do you do physical therapy early? Or you just do a home exercise program uh, as he outlined and then send them, it seems like, when they're transitioning? I think I do the same thing as John. I don't really initiate physical therapy too early on because in my area, there isn't that many therapists who kind of fully understand what we do with the cartilage implantation or with Macy. So I don't want them kind of overdoing it saying like, oh, it's, a, it's an ACL. We got to get range of motion. We got to get the swelling out, all this stuff. I don't want them to be aggressive with it. So I do fairly similar to what John does. I, I actually sh you know, shut them down, leave them go in extension for that first day. Post-op, just let them recover from the arthrotomy and whatnot, start that CPM. Um, if they can tolerate what with eight hours a day, right? Uh, you you can have them go in the CPM. Start off um, just initially fairly slow. Um, I still I also do the same thing with partial weight bearing, especially for a weight bearing lesion on this on the central part of the condyle. Uh, with range of motion, it's fairly similar. I go to zero to ninety by four weeks uh, post op, and yeah, actually it's fairly similar. Great. You talked about uh, chondrotoxicity, uh, the concern with Eliquis. Um, why don't you tie in other agents, uh, just touch on NSAIDs uh, in your practice, uh, uh, is there contraindication uh, and you know, just other thoughts on that regard, medications. Who is that for, Seth, me? Yeah, you, you can answer that one about yeah, the I'm, concerns I'm, about chondrotoxicity with any agents, particularly obviously the Eliquis, but then uh, other things like NSAIDs. 
Yes, I, I don't have them use ANSEDS for at least three months. I know it's theoretical. I know there's been some studies that show it, it may not matter, but I, I'm just not comfortable in doing it. And I use a lot of Tylenol instead, and it seems that that's just as effective. Excellent. And uh, I think in the interest of time, we'll move on to case number two. So this is uh, Dr. Lee. Go for it. All right. So I have a 41-year-old male who presents as with a two-year history of medial sided knee pain. He is a construction worker, big, solid, muscular guy. Uh, used to be a really avid runner, but now has switched over to be a more avid cyclist. Um, and his history is a little complicated. Uh, both knees have been have had injuries. On the on this side, he had a history of a PCL reconstruction 21 years ago after a fall off his bike, and then a history of a chondroplastia microfracture of that medial femoral condyle about eight years ago. Uh, so before he came to see me, he had undergone a recent knee arthroscopy and partial metastectomy uh, with chondroplasty about 18 months um, ago. And interestingly enough, he did get symptomatic relief immediately post-op, uh, but then he tripped, fell over something, stepped really awkwardly, and then has had his knee felt never felt the same ever since this. Um, he's had steroid injections and visco injections with no relief. On physical exam, um, exam was pretty benign. He had no effusion. He had full active range of motion, but um, and just a little bit of medial joint line tenderness, but no McMurray's exam. Um, his PCL actually felt fairly solid for being a 20-year-old PCL reconstruction. So um, it was a grade one with a good endpoint. And these are what his radiographs show. And then uh, we obtained an MRI that um, it's a little hard to see probably on this, but the idea was that we, we identified a large uh, chondral defect within the medial femoral condyle. There was no significant subchondral edema. Um, there was also, interestingly enough, an osteophyte noted on the, um, within the intralesional part of the, of the condyle. I think you see better on the coronal images. Um, and his meniscus was found to be intact. So oh, now we open it to the panel members. Seth, I will have you divvy up questions in, in terms of what I guess to, uh, go forward. This was uh, uh, this was um, just prompting uh, any thoughts for any other uh, information that you might want uh, that we're missing uh, from the presentation. So we have regular X-rays. We have an MRI. Uh, anything else you want, Pamphrey, in these types of cases? Well, alignment films. Uh, you know, I think that. Typically, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Um, yeah. Do you do those routinely on, on these part of those restoration patients? Yeah, I, I do pretty pretty routinely. Even if they, they look like they're a neutral, I'll get them. Yep. And so, uh, Cassandra, this patient uh, is in uh, how many, a little bit of varus on, on the index side, is that correct? Yeah, uh, just a little bit, a couple degrees, but not, not enough to write home about. How much is too much for? Actually, I guess that's debate, right? How much is how much? At which point do you get it? Would you consider addressing alignment? What is considered too much ferrous? I think it's interesting here, and we'll see with the, one of the next cases where alignment comes up in a, a different way. So this one um, is a couple of degrees. Uh, I like to know what the other side is: symmetry of varus or asymmetry or decompensation helps me in decision making whether alignment comes into the picture. But uh, in the interest of the moment, um, go ahead, Cassandra, and then I'll, I'll ask the guys. Okay. Seth, if I might add one thing. I sure. also find that where the defect is on the femoral condyle, I think is important as to whether or not I would do an osteotomy. Because if it's a far medial lesion as opposed to a lateral lesion on the medial femoral condyle, that might affect exactly how I'm going to address the issue of osteotomy especially here with it's just a couple degrees. If you're on the borderline, that's a great thought, yep. Mm -hmm. um, so this is what we did. We decided to go for diagnostic arthroscopy. Uh, noticed that he had a grade four lesion, medial condyle, fairly large, 3.6 centimeters by two centimeters. So almost the entirety of his condyle. Uh, as you can see there in the meniscus, uh, at the body looks pretty good. There might be a little hint of, a, in hindsight, obviously, uh, there might be a hint of some degeneration along the junction of the posterior horn and border. Uh, but he's also had amino metastectomy there done before. So what we did was uh, we, I did a chondroplasty, took out this thing that was stuck to the lesion itself. And I presumed, I call it intralesional osteophyte, but I don't have a better term for it. So Mike Banfi, um, 
this patient, so we're looking at this as a large defect, meniscus a little irregular, some you know changes on the tibia, maybe some of those osteophytes, they have the prior baggage of the ligament recon, the early osteophyte. Uh, is this a slam dunk, Macy? Is this a borderline candidate? Uh, is this a poor candidate? Is this someone you'd do some, something different? And would you do uh, osteotomy? Yeah, so I, I don't think that it's a, a slam dunk. You know, I, I think that with, with those interlegional osteophytes or whatever that is, you know, that, that you know, makes things a little bit more difficult. He also had some flattening of his medial condyle, so some pre-arthritic changes, um, which, you know, as we'll see later, you know, that, that you can do uh, Macy in those patients, but I, I just think that they're a little trickier. You know, I think that if he was neutral uh, on the other side or, or even slightly valgus, I definitely would do an osteotomy on him just to try to unload it if I'm doing a cellular-based treatment. Um, but, you know, with, with an isolated lesion in this patient, I may be inclined to go for an OCA. John, uh, would you do Macy? And if so, would you combine it with an osteotomy or do you do something uh, very much different? A couple questions. One, is it a contained or uncontained lesion? Technically, it's uncontained. I don't have a picture off the foramedial side where it kind of falls off the edge of the condyle. And how much flattening is it towards the, la the medial most aspect of the femoral condyle? Is there a large spur or anything and that it flattens it out when it articulates with the meniscus or is it still fairly round medially? I think it's, rel it's not round and it's not flat. <laughs> uh, my, in my experience, this is something that I would be very comfortable doing a Macy on. It's, it's very large for an osteochondral allograft. If you were thinking that, you might want to do something like a bio-uni, because as you start debriding it, it's historically a lot larger than you believe. And otherwise, you end up putting a couple snowmen in. I found that this would be something that would be amenable to a Macy. And since it's on the far medial aspect of the medial femoral condyle, like we were talking about, I might be inclined to do an osteotomy and just do a five degree correction. Or you, you have to play with it a little because you don't want to overcorrect. So it's, you know, I might even look at a valgus uh, loading um, stress x ray before I started to try to determine because it's really on that border. Mike Baffey, how do you determine uh, kind of meniscus sufficiency if they've had prior partial resections? I mean, that meniscus was intact, yes, but in certain slices, it looked to me a little diminutive. And here, it certainly doesn't look perfectly healthy. Are there ways to evaluate before or during surgery? Or what's your threshold for when you might need to think of doing something to the meniscus too? You know, I, I think that's a good question. I, I don't know if I have the perfect answer for that. You know, it's, I think it's kind of one of those things you, you know when you look at it. I mean, I mean, there's, you know, there's just not su sufficient meniscus left. I think that really if it's the posterior horn, the posterior body, it's completely gone, but there still is some mid-body and anterior horn. I kind of consider that um, meniscal deficient. Um, so really, I'm, I'm paying more attention to the posterior aspect of the meniscus. Mm -hmm. And so in the interest of time, Cassandra, let's see what you did. All right, so after much canceling, we decided to go down the road of Macy. Um, his alignment, I don't really recall. I, I think it was fairly similar to the contralateral side, so that's why I did not do an osteotomy on him. And um, and I told him I thought this was really big for an osteochondral graft, given that it would have to be the majority of his condyle, yes, and it wasn't contained. Yeah, so in that sense, we're like, you know what, let's go for the Macy and see how much we can get. So isolated lesion, um, he had, um, so our surgical plan was just regular arthrotomy. Um, prepare the borders and this was a little bit uncontained so you can see on this is the more anterior aspect right here on the uh, bottom picture and then so it might have been just slightly uncontained nearly but also I'm sorry laterally into the notch and then just slightly uh, uncontained on the far medial aspect so I'm just kind of showing um, just getting that vertical borders and making sure to clean out any cartilage that is not that is questionable so and then that's just uh, just the technique. So you guys all know the techniques, but whoever's uh, tuning in, in terms of you want to make sure they have nice vertical borders to nice healthy cartilage with good shoulders, you want to take out um, all that um, um, calcified cartilage layer down to, it's almost like scraping tartar off of teeth, if you will. There's a nice kind of gritty uh, texture to it. And then when it comes off, you know you're down to subchondral bone. And then that area where he had a prior macrofracture, 
And I kind of wonder, looking at the lesion, did he actually have like an OCD way back when? Because that's roughly in that area. But there's definitely a ridge of sclerotic bone in that central picture that you can see. And I think that correlated with that weird, what I would call an interlesional osteophyte on that diagnostic scope. So what I did was I was fairly aggressive about debriding all that sclerotic bone, trying to get down to bone that felt and looked more like cancellous bone as opposed to sclerotic bone. Cassandra, how did you debreed the uh, intralesional osteophyte? I used a, a high-speed burr. And then I used a curette later on just to kind of get the feel of it. So, but a lot of it is just visual and just, and, but the burr you can kind of feel when you get past that sclerotic bone down to into that cancellous subchondral bone. And then the technique wise, whatever you guys end up using, I, I typically take a foil off of the uh, suture pack and then make sure that the colored side is cell side down. So I can kind of dummy proof it in my head in case things get mess messed up in terms of what side is the cells, what sides are not, so that the silver side is looking out at me. And then that's how I, if I see the, um, the, the color that I know that the cell sides are up towards me and that's how I cut out my, my template. And then after lots of fiber and glue, I lay that down. So you can see on that far medial side, um, it was slightly uncontained and now was heading towards that osteophyte that John was kind of talking about. Um, medially, it was also uncontained. With something this big, I actually sutured down the edges just because I don't try quite trust the uh, fiber and glue alone. What kind so, of uh, 6-0 Vicryl. Uh, preferably, uh, as I get older, I'd like it to be dyed, but apparently I only have undyed ones now. So. And uh, let me just ask Mike, uh, do you use a tourniquet for these cases? And what are your tips and tricks for uh, hemostasis in, in these lesions, particularly when you burn down uh, you know, part of it uh, to get rid of the osteophyte? So, you know, I, I a lot of times will use a uh, tourniquet for the approach and um, you know, but then I'll, I'll take it down and, and, you know, make sure I have everything, um, you know, a nice uh, dry bed. I do think that TXA is a great uh, adjuvant to, uh, for these cases to try to, uh, you know, help with the, the bleeding issues. But then, you know, if you're still having problems, fiber and glue is a little layer of fiber and glue will work great to uh, coagulate things as well. John, anything else to add there? Um, rarely do I get a needle tip bovie if I have just a point bleeding that I can't. I usually use uh, pledgets with epinephrine soaked uh, liquids. I put pressure on it. I try fibrin uh, and pressure as well. And then only then would I think of just trying to cauterize if I thought there was a single little vessel. I've had to do that before. I typically don't use tourniquets for most of these joint preservation. I use thrombin gel foam with thumb pressure and a ray tech. So multiple different ways uh, similar to skin the cat. So uh, go ahead, Cassandra. Take All it right. Home. So uh, three months post-op, he was uh, putting on his pants and he felt a hurt and heard a loud pop in his knee. Um, he started having medial side knee pain after that. And he said that this was different than where he was preoperatively. So he noticed that the pain was worse with a terminal extension. And then when he when it pops, he feels like he has relief in his knee. He feels he states it feels like popping a knuckle. So I obtained an MRI because you never like to hear pops in people's knees, uh, especially just putting on your pants. So um, this is what the MRI shows. So overall, you can see that the, the implant uh, on that first top left, you can actually see the implant in place. Uh, but then the bottom right, you can see that the meniscus is not doing so well in that posterior horn. John, what are you doing at this point? Is that is the meniscus torn or is the implant still in place on the far bottom on the right? I think that's always really hard to actually tell um, a lot of times with the MRI, right? Um, so that's always a question, like did the implant come off and peel off and just fold over on top of the meniscus or is that the meniscus? Yeah, I mean, that, that would be my concern that the implant may not be stable. And so I, I would probably be somewhat aggressive in taking a look again. And there we go, second look arthroscopy, roughly at four months post-op. So this is how much fill he had of his implant. Um, I, I think each time I go in for a second, second look, I'm always kind of blown away by the science of it uh, and in terms of what can fill in. So you can see that the meniscus definitely looked kind of crappy at the posterior horn junction of the body and the posterior horn, that really tight area that in hindsight, I think I could see on the original diagnostic scope. Um, but at that time it was stable and I didn't do anything with it. So. 
Um, but you can see that I think with the flap of that meniscus that came up, he took off a little chunk off of the very far medial aspect of that condyle. But overall, the weight bearing surface of the condyle looked really good. So all I did was just trim the meniscus and that was it. I would just say at time zero, you know, in the staging scope, if you can't see the meniscus in full, I have a low threshold just to trephinate I, in general, the MCL, so I can actually see and really assess to Banfrey's point, it is hard, you know, how much meniscus is left, is it healthy or not? And then again, I think just for me, this is an osteotomy case, um, as we brought up that point, um, but uh, amazing how good the majority of that huge defect is filling. And, uh, you know, three months. Yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty pretty incredible. So, um, Mike, besides uh, debriding as Cassandra did, are you doing anything else at this point or are you, you watchful waiting after that? I think that I would do just the same thing, you know, just, just uh, clean everything up. The weight bearing surface is still looking pretty darn good um, and, and see how he does. John, you're using a loader brace. <laughs> uh, I am and I am probably get, getting ready to do a meniscal transplant, to be honest with you. Okay, so you're going to protect that Macy and, and really uh, I am, and uh, at the same time of doing the implant, I will do some type of cartilage procedure, depending on how big that lesion, in fact, is. So on the four medial side where it came off? Yes. Because yeah, right. that's what's going to load against your meniscus. And so if you're going to do a meniscal transplant and you don't take care of the cartilage, then you're going to cause problems with the meniscal uh, transplant as well. Just to make sure I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not missing something. If, if you ever see a Macy in these early or stop and it's delaminating, is there any role for refixation or is that a uh, ship sailed? Or does anyone have any experience with that? I don't know. So if it's delaminated, you breed just the part that's not, not attached anymore. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on. Uh, Mike, take it away, bud. All right. So our, our third case here, this is a 31-year-old uh, gentleman. He's a you know avid weekend soccer player, you know, collegiate soccer player that, that uh, you know now has a full-time job but, but still likes to play. And he said uh, actually bilateral knee issues, but the, the left knee is the one that's bothered him the most. This is the one he's had surgery on previously. He had a history of a microfracture on the uh, lateral from a condyle approximately five years ago. So we had those x-rays, uh, you know, one of them is a, um, a notch view, I believe, or maybe they, they look the same, the same thing, but he has you know, preserved joint space, you know, maybe slight flattening of the condyle on that, that lateral side on the, uh, the left knee. Um, this is his lateral as well as his uh, uh, merchant views, and, and those look okay as well. And these are his alignment film. So, you know, very standard for me to get these. And you can see he has some uh, significant uh, differences between the two sides. He's not in, um, you know, Frank Valgus, you know, overloading that part of the joint. But given the fact that he's a uh, little varus on the other side, you know, that, that started shaping my, my decision process and, and kind of giving him the different options. The other thing, though, is you can see he has a, a slight leg length discrepancy with his left side being a little bit longer than his right. And, um, so I think that could be an interesting uh, discussion point as well. But on his exam, he's got full range of motion. He does have tenderness on the uh, lateral joint line on that left knee, not on the right. Um, you know, just looking at him clinically, he did look a little bit valgus compared to the contralateral side, the normal ligamentous exam, and a little bit of an effusion. These are his uh, MRIs, this is our coronal view here. You can see that his uh, meniscus appears to be intact, but he has that focal defect, probably the side of the, the previous microfracture on that lateral from condyle. The medial side looks okay, and ACL and PCL look fine also. And these are his arthroscopic pictures. So pretty big defect uh, once I was probing it, measured it three by three, but the uh, subchondral bone was intact. So we obtained a biopsy and um, you know uh, he had nothing else going on in the knee. I thought the lateral meniscus looked okay. So, uh, John, from what you're seeing on this uh, case, um, if you're going to treat this defect uh, with uh, Macy, is this a slam dunk indication? Uh, is this a borderline one, or is this a poor choice and you should kind of go in a different uh, direction? It's interesting. It's in the lateral femoral condyle, and usually I find that the 
articular cartilage is much thinner on the lateral side than the medial side. So I find it more challenging to do lateral femoral condyles and get them to heal well. It looks like it's a fairly well constrained defect. I think it would be pretty straightforward. I am a little concerned about his alignment compared to his other side as the way his body normally loads the knee is a little more in varus. And so one might think of unloading that a little with an osteotomy um, to sort of equate to where he is on the other side. I think also another option, you know, is an osteochondral allograph, but it's still a, a large lesion. And, and it, I think a Macy would do a very good job on this. Cassandra, prior Mike fracture, um, does that push you towards osteochondral allograph? Or uh, does it, is it more thoughtful for that understanding uh, the health of the subchondral bone uh, on your imaging and maybe at the time of the staging scope? It does make me a little hesitant with regards to proceeding with Macy. I think on that MR, you can see a subtle hint of some subchondral edema. So I, don't, I wouldn't call this a slam dunk. I would call this potentially um, kind of pushing it in terms of the indication. Um, again, just like everything John was saying in terms of the alignment, you know, as, a, as an avid soccer player, he's physiologic, uh, you know, varus, and then that knee is not quite in that same alignment. So, um, and then also, if you looked at the anterior horn lateral meniscus, there's some kind of degeneration and some cleavage in there. So it makes me kind of wonder, is this a lot more, is this a lot more advanced in terms of degeneration that I'm appreciating just by the surface look? So couple things to take in mind. Yeah, so I don't know if I would be as aggressive to put an osteotomy in there, but I certainly would be maybe aggressive on uh, cleaning out that bone for that Macy if I, if that's the road we were going to choose. Mike, it's fascinating. Do you, do you think that the alignment's actively changing from Varus where he started to now neutral because of the cartilage wear, uh, even with the meniscus looking still okay? Hard to say. You know, it, 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 it could have been like that from birth. He's got that, that strange uh, leg length discrepancy as well. And, and that could have led to the, the you know, increased issue on this left knee. I, I really don't have a good answer for that, but they certainly are uh, two different legs. And John, osteotomy, yes or no? Is there an intralesional osteophyte and how much chronic changes from the prior microfraction? That would be what would push me towards an osteotomy. Yeah, no, no intralesional osteophyte. Um, and there was a little bit of edema in the bone, but, um, but there was no bone loss. If there's some edema, I would probably do a varus osteotomy. Unless, uh, if, if I thought there was enough edema, though, I would go to an osteochondral allograft. Yeah, there wasn't a ton of edema. Can you give me a sense of uh, how deep into flexion this defect goes? Is it going into flexion or mostly in the main extension weight-bearing zone? Those lateral ones always are pretty deep. Um, and you, you know, in, in a way that makes doing a Macy a little bit easier because you can sneak it back there and your, your angle of attack with the OCA sometimes is kind of hard. Um, so to, to, I guess the best way to answer this is to do the Macy that we did, you know, he, he was flexed up to about hundred degrees to be able to access that post aspect of the condo. Yeah, I guess my point uh, that I've learned from kind of Al Get Good is uh, that if you're doing an osteotomy, you know, one, I've never done osteotomy from neutral to varus, so I'm intrigued if you decide to do that, um, but it's interesting for this case. Um, but uh, if you did uh, on the femoral side, that's really unloading in extension, whereas a small correction tibia for this kind of a case uh, would get you into flexion and extension, you know, because the tibia really affects both. So just fascinating as us Americans try to wrap our heads around osteotomy world. But uh, go ahead and tell us what you did. So very similar to the discussion that we had, uh, you know, we, we were having here in the, on the uh, video, uh, how with the patient, and we discussed uh, doing an OCA versus Macy. He, he really believed in Macy and wanted to go that route. And sometimes I'll let that affect my decision process as well. So that's what we proceeded with here. This was, um, you know, pre-cookie cutter uh, Macy. This is, I, I believe, back in 2018. And uh, so you can see the, the defect that um, uh, we've prepared there with the, uh, the graft has already been described with regard to the placement of the cell side down. One thing though, I think that, that's interesting and may have some um, ramifications as we go on further with this case is that you can see that when I, when I was first using Macy um, with that transition over from the second generation ACI, I was having the, um, 
the the rim of the of the membrane come up along the rim of the uh, the defects, almost like a like a pie crust. And I no longer do that. I, I think that that probably was leaving um, some uh, unstable borders that potentially could have some issues. I, I don't know about you guys. Um, are you just seeding it directly down into the defect like I am now, or are you having a little bit of rise up on the uh, the edges? Go ahead, John. I normally don't try to have it rise up on the edges. I wish I could say that I cut it perfectly every time and right. it down. You know, I I don't want it to be very high. And as it looks like you've done here, and the cartilage thickness is rather thin on the lateral femoral condyle, and that was what I was speaking of, is that you have to be much more technically accurate uh, on the lateral side because it's a lot thinner and you have less uh, room for error. Yeah, I, I want to in that depth of that defect, you know, um, uh, but uh, here it's more challenging than let's say the patella where the you know cartilage is much thicker and you can really get it down there without the risk. Um, one thing I do, if I notice as I'm transitioning to the table and I notice it's too big, I, you know, and I have the fiber and glue that's, you know, about to set, I'll actually find my best fit down as, as flush to the subchondral bone in, in one area and I'll allow one side of it just to hang off uh, and I'll trim that side later. So I have time before my peripheral gluing. So, you know, it, it has to happen quickly, but not tremendously quickly. You can get most of it perfect and then, you know, nitpick one, one other part of it, just one, uh, you know, small uh, tip or trick uh, in the heat of battle. So go ahead, Mike. And then the, the other common procedure I did was a distal femoral osteotomy. So I, I corrected his alignment to the, the contralateral leg. Um, and, you know, I think that you could argue, you know, doing the osteotomy with a, uh, a closing wedge versus opening wedge because you had the leg length discrepancy. Personally, in my hands is what I've done the most, our, our opening wedge, that's what I did here. Um, you know, I, I, we, I actually discussed this with the patient. I, I don't think that, you know, a five degree correction is going to give him significant length. Um, and he, fortunately, he didn't notice it after the case. So these are his, his post-op x-rays. Um, you can see that uh, the, the, you know, the plate's sitting appropriately, the, the, we have the graft in there. These are immediately post-op. And uh, he, he did quite well. You know, he um, was able to, to regrain all of his motion. He had no effusion. Uh, he then, I believe, started complaining of, of a clicking. So never had any pain. Just had this clicking on a lateral aspect of his uh, knee. And so I was thinking that this was just secondary from this plate. Th this plate in and of itself was kind of the bane of my existence for like the first five years of my practice. And I've now uh, transitioned away from it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of a prominent plate. doesn't fit that perfectly. And so we had the idea of, well, hey, you know, if this is bugging you, we're now a year and a half out from surgery, let's just take the plate out and we'll, we'll do a, a diagnostic arthroscopy at the same time. Prior to doing that, we did get an MRI and, um, you know, the, the MRI looks pretty good. You know, it seems to be pretty good fill, maybe a, a little uh, area on that lateral from a condyle that, that doesn't look perfect, but I have found after these Macy's, it's never going to look perfect. You know, it, it, uh, there's always going to be a little bit of post-surgical change there. So I didn't really know how to interpret that. But the uh, one other thing, though, is the edema in the bone's gone. So the, the, the osteotomy or the Macy did something. Mm -hmm. so, so here is his, ex or his, uh, his diagnostic pictures. Uh, patella, trochlea, all looks great. Medial compartment looks good. ACL, PCL looks good. And um, then once I got over into that lateral compartment, you know, for the most part, things are looking pretty good. It, it has a good fill, except at the very anterior part. So that's what you're seeing there on the bottom uh, right picture. That little flap there just is it, not, not really adhered or not adhered at all. And so I, I see that. I'm like, oh, geez, here we go. This is going to turn into the, the orange peel. I'm going to be able to pull this whole thing right off. But um, luckily, I was able just to debride it, and I, I got stable edges. So this measured probably about, you know, I don't know, I'd say five by five millimeters where that where the grade four changes are. Maybe you know eight by eight if you want to count the um the the surrounding areas of cartilage. And then we took the plate out and you know discussed this with him. And clearly he was bummed because it wasn't totally perfect, but he had no pain, got all this range of motion back. These are his uh his alignment films afterwards. I thought they looked pretty good. I mean, he's he's equaled out now, and um we were probably about I don't know, a year out from doing this and uh, he's doing quite well, really no issues playing soccer and, you know, knock on wood, it'll stay that way.
Cassandra, when do you uh, let these guys uh, return to sport? Oh, that's always the, the nerve wracking part. Um, I guess with the osteotomy and, you know, that fill that you see right there, I mean, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to. So I would say usually about, I would say a year, 18 months, somewhere in there, like full high impact activity. I know that I know the consensus statement for the rehab says that you can, for a condyle lesion, you can let them get back in nine to 12 months, but I don't think I'm quite there yet. Cause I think the matrix does um, kind of add more, um, glycosaminoglycans and, and and whatnot so that that can Im improve that compression over the next, you know, between 12 and 18 months. So I think patients can continue to improve from one year up to two years after this implant. John, for a straightforward Macy of the condyle, when do you allow a run progression? I, as long as there's no marrow edema, straight ahead jogging, I would probably start by six months. I, if it's someone who's a high competitive athlete, I would probably get an MRI and look at the fill before and the sort of the integrity of it with the surrounding cartilage. I probably would not do that before 12 months. Danfie, what clinical signs are you looking at in your functional progressions towards activity? What are the most important indicators? Obviously, John's looking also at MRI signal and fill. Um, what do you look at clinically uh, each time? What's, what's your red flags where you're like, you're doing too much, slow down? Well, well I think that uh, when you're trying to have a, a game plan with the patient, you know, you gotta you know, obviously put the timeline down there with regard to biology, but even if it's, if it's long enough from, from a biological standpoint for things to be healed and you know, what we think should be adhered to bone and, and matured and whatnot, they really got the good mus uh, neuromuscular control. So you know, I, I like to use you know, some form of assessment for that. Um, you know, it could be a, a, a fancy assessment from a, um, a, a physical therapist that goes through a battery of things. We actually have a force plate uh, system here. So we look at leg symmetry index with that. I mean, but, but it, you know, I used to just use a, a single leg squat and, and get assessment that way just to make sure that they, you know, don't go into, you know, um, you know valgus tilt or anything like that. So I think the neuromuscular control is really important. But, um, you know, as far as, you know, warning signs and uh, they're, they're doing too much. I think that if they're just, you know, coming in with, with increasing pain, um, things that things that just don't seem right, they're, that they're probably trying to cheat the, the progression, that's when I'll start ordering MRIs. And I'll be pretty aggressive with that just to make sure that um, we don't really get behind ourselves. Yeah, I agree. Painful effusions, uh, you know, for me are my biggest barometer throughout the, the rehabilitation uh, course. Um, so that was a great case. Um, I would actually jump in and ask a question for that. Like, so if you're looking at painful effusions, I guess, when do you typically see these effusions? When do you start worrying that something's going wrong early? Like at which point should the effusion go away? Yeah, I'm not worried about a, um, you know, if it's a slow and steady progression and the patient's doing the right thing, I have my right, my good therapist and you know, they're doing everything on schedule. Uh, and they have just some boggy synovitis or effusions in the mid rehab. I might uh, incorporate some orthobiologics at that time. You know, PRP, HA, synergistic. You know, calm them down and and just go a little slower than even what we stated earlier. Uh, I think abrupt changes uh, for me probably would matter. Either uh, traumatic incidences or clear overdoing it or noncompliance coupled with significant pain, a, a new limp, and a large effusion. Or or what your patient said like a pop or something, something really mechanical. So um, if no one has any other comments, this is uh, Cassandra's case. We're getting into some, some more complex cases now to, to round up and take us home. All right. So this is a 36 year old uh, male. He's a personal trainer. Uh, so really great shape. Uh, basically coming in with a two year history of knee pain and swelling after playing a basketball game. Like he said, he played, he dunked and he landed and he felt that he had some pain, but he couldn't really describe it. Um, he then underwent a left knee scope and a chondroplasty at an outside hospital. And at that time, they were noted, he was noted to have a lesion of his medial condyle and his trochlea. Um, he underwent just chondroplasty and an ACI biopsy at the time. Um, so initially post-op though, he said that he did really well. So at six weeks post-op, he was able to get back into play and do his all his activities. But after that time, after, you know, at six months after the procedure, he just couldn't do his job as a personal trainer. So on exam, um, pretty unremarkable. There's no effusion. He had good motion. He was actually non tender palpation on the joint line, no crepitus. His uh, exam was pretty much negative. 
And then on MRI that um, I brought in, we got was that we saw that the, he had a grade three lesion on his medifemoral condyle. Pretty subtle. It wasn't that obvious on the, I, you can probably see it on the second coronal shot a little bit better, that area of the medifemoral condyle. And then also it was noted that he had a lesion um, on his trochlea. And on that top view, you can almost see that there's like an osteophyte within the central portion of that uh, trochlear lesion. So John, uh, who come in, sorry, I'm having a little echo. Uh, when you have patients who come in and they have um, uh, a staging scope elsewhere, they have their, their scope pictures, you have a new MRI, is that enough information for you? Or do you need a new staging? Uh, uh, how often do you have to do that? It's obviously would be a hard sell for a patient. If they had a biopsy and if it was someone I knew and they gave me very good pictures, I would consider it because I, I don't think you have to do it. If you know someone has done a good debridement, uh, if they haven't, my general practice is that I, I go in and I look at it myself because then I get a little better idea unless I'm sure it's a Macy or certain technique because it's so variable as to what's the containment, where in the condyle is it, and what is the surrounding tissue because some of the surrounding tissue may be intact but maybe something that I'll debride away. And so that's the hard part. So that's where you really have to have sort of that tactile information and say, okay, how soft was the cartilage at the edge of the defect? And, and so most of the time that'll lead me to do it, a, a procedure myself, unless someone can really answer those detailed questions. Cassandra, can you comment on the climbing? And then uh, did you note the size of the uh, defect from like the Macy biopsy form? Is, is that useful or is it always the op report from someone else? Or how do you kind of piece things together? I was trying to actually remember if I actually saw the Macy biopsy form. I actually don't remember. I think, I think the information actually came from the Macy biopsy form because the scope pictures that he did bring in were not helpful. A again, this goes back to like how scopes are oriented and stuff for other people, right? I just couldn't tell what was what. Mm -hmm. I don't think that actually there's actually a picture of the trochlear lesion um, on that on his scope. So it, it was one of those tough discussions. I think I, I got as much imaging as I could. Um, so I got the MRI when he came came to me because I wasn't sure because he had no you know i was trying to go off clinical history and, and exam in terms of what where was the symptomatic and was this really truly indicated um but he was definitely convinced that this is you know that surgeon told him is what he needed so therefore he had to get macy so, so mike this is a, a personal trainer he's 36 he's got multifocal disease without a few things or mechanical symptoms and he wants to go back to like high activities is this a slam dunk is this a borderline indication is this a poor indication uh what do you think I don't, I definitely don't think it's a slam dunk, um, but I, I think that there's good indications to do it. You know, he's got, uh, you know, multiple defects. I think that the, the trochlea is a, a great place to put a, a Macy graft. Um, so I, I think I'd go the same route. What is the alignment and what is the TTTG distance? I think everything was normal. I don't have those in this. I forgot to put them into the PowerPoint. Absolutely. So. Neutral alignment, yeah, and his TTTG was uh, normal. And so here's the defects. This is the information you had from the uh, medical records. And so uh, why don't you walk us through what you did? Yeah, so we ended up doing uh, a Macy. Um, and so no no issues with that alignment. So no osteotomies were done, just medial paraparatal arthrotomy. So there's a trochlear lesion, fairly central medial. Um, and then the medial from a condyle lesion uh, was actually much worse than a grade three than what you saw in the scope picture. So you can see that right there towards uh, on, the, on the right picture. So um, just basically prepare two lesions. Um, again, the techniques we talked about, the trochlear bone was a little bit different. So, I, but overall, I think there was no actual osteophyte that was uh, noted in there. So, um, and then just place the two uh, membranes. So. All right, so postoperatively, unremarkable recovery. He was, seemed to be fairly compliant, um, uh, working on getting his um, mass, and he seemed to verbalize understanding of like how to do the rehab protocol. So he actually did a lot of his rehab on his own rather than go to a physical therapist. At seven months, he said that he was jogging across the street because he forgot about uh, his issues. He hadn't started a running program yet. Um, and then he started noticing some mild pain on the medial aspect of his knee, and then he had some swelling. He actually... Um, 
kind of explained that away to me saying that like, well, he actually had sugar that day and, and as opposed to like his normal clean eating. And then he also had some edibles. So he wasn't, he kind of, he explained it away. So I wasn't sure what to make of it. So it was one of those things I just kept on watching him to see it. I'm like, hey, slow down your rehab. Let's see what's going on. And then, and then let's ramp up in a couple of weeks and see if, it, if you can get there. And he couldn't. So 10 months post-op, he um, started noting more sharp pain around his knee um, on the medial aspect and it would consistently occur roughly around 30 degrees. So nothing mechanical, no locking, no catching, but certainly a sharp pain every time he got into about 30 degrees of flexion. So we ended up getting another MRI and this is what we saw at 13 months post-op. Mike, what do you think? Well, I'll tell you what, you know, the, 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 uh, the personal trainers or the chiropractors or even the physical therapists that are like, I'm going to do my own rehab. I know how to do everything. That terrifies me. You know, like, you, it, I really try to convince them not to do that. I know that it's, it's generally impossible to convince them. So, you know, I think that that was the, the first strike against him. But, you know, clearly there's, there's a lot of edema in that, you know, from a condom now. Um, you know, it's, it's hard for me to really assess that, that graph looks pretty thickened on, on some of those cuts. It doesn't look like it's totally ripped off though. John, what's your plan going in uh, at this point now? Uh, I'm very concerned of where the edema is towards the notch. Uh, as Mike says, it looks like some of it may have come off cause it's, it looks like it's bowed. And so I'm thinking that there is probably some graft failure. And then the question is, and we didn't talk about it on the other uh, patient because it was a small eight by eight millimeter defect. But if this is larger, what is my fallback? And I stratify that by sizes. This one, I'm afraid that to do some type of cell-based uh, treatment because of all the edema. And I might want to debride it and then think about an osteochondral allograft. You do that in stages, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so here's the second look. Go ahead, Christine. Yeah, so what, about 13, more than 13 months post uh, implant, this is what I saw. So John kind of got it right on the head or, and, and Mike too. Uh, looking at the lesion, it looked like it did peel off. It wasn't completely peeled off, but you can see it's, it's just that anterior leading edge just did not take. And then that's probably where it started kind of peeling off. And I think that's where that progression went from like seven months uh, where we felt that first twinge until 10 months, we started feeling more consistent pain at 30 degrees. So I think that pain, piece just kept on peeling and peeling off. But you can see on the right side, the trochlea looks pretty darn nice, pretty good at 13 months. So then um, I went ahead and just debrided it. And yes, there we go. So Mike, um, what are you gonna do now? I, I think the, the allograft's the way to go. I mean, he's, he has a large pothole in that knee. He's got all that edema, you know, and, and you know, I, I, I think that uh, sometimes, you know, putting in, mature um, head and cartilage in, in someone that isn't the most reliable rehabber is a little bit safer. And there we go. So this is what the second look looked like. So on that far right, that's actually the trochlear implant. So that's what, 14, 15 months. It looks great. And in terms of texture and, and feel of it, it actually had pretty good. It felt fairly similar to the adjacent cartilage. Um, but looking at the medial condyle, so part of his implant actually did take that posterior segment, that center picture right there, if you can see that posterior segment of that, that looks a little wider, or maybe a little bit more raised, that's actually the Macy implant. Um, so that anterior half kind of peeled off and whatever, whatever reason, the anterior part peeled off a little bit and then uh, created that um, lesion defect. So place an osteochondral graft, and that's where, that's where that is. John, if you're choosing between uh, Macy and osteochondral allograft in the setting of maybe some borderline malalignment parameters, uh, are you more apt to do the realignment uh, if you're doing the Macy? Uh, and are you more apt to putting in mature hyaline maybe to not do the osteotomy? Is that faulty thinking? Is that reasonable? Do we have evidence to, to support that line of approach? I don't know how much evidence there is to support that, but I, I that's how I stratify my opinions, just like you mentioned, Seth. Mike, any thoughts on that? Is that where you're, you are now? If you're doing Macy, you're more apt to, to optimize the joint environment for cell-based, uh, where you might hedge bet a little more with the OCAs? Yeah, 100%. I, I mean, if I have someone that has 
you know, significant malalignment and we're, we're doing an OCA because, you know, they, they have a little bit more bone loss that I feel comfortable with or something like that. I, I still will do a, a alignment procedure on them as well. But uh, on those, those border ones, you know, I think that I'm, I'm more aggressive with the, um, with the cell-based therapies. Yeah, and I think we have to, I think we know that for cell-based that the outcomes are improved by osteotomy. I, I don't think that we know that the outcomes are equivalent without osteotomy for OCA. So we need to follow these patients carefully and really uh, pull and track them and make sure we're not fooling ourselves into false comfort with the time zero, uh, durable, mature hyaline. So this is just food for some more thought. Um, so we have two more cases. These get a little crazy. Uh, the next one's uh, John Lane. In the interest of time, John, let's just have you go through the, the whole case and then maybe we can either comment or ask a question and we'll do the same for Mike's case and then uh, wrap it up. So uh, John, go ahead, my friend. Okay, this is a very complicated case. I'll try to streamline it as much as I can. I initially treated him for his right knee for a simple ACL tear. Uh, after continuing to complain about his other knee for several years, and I kept trying to avoid it, uh, finally, it was like, look, I can't do anything. Uh, he was a FedEx driver. He slipped, hyperextended his knee. He has a prior history of a PCL reconstruction uh, with just some mild laxity. Um, and it's the left knee. So his range of motion was full. He had a slight posterior sag. Um, we evaluated it with an MRI and he had a, a medial meniscus tear with some extrusion, full thickness chondral loss on the medial femoral condyle with some marginal osteophytes. So this clearly is a, a salvage type procedure. So I tried him with physical therapy for a couple of years, anti-inflammatories. We did visco supplementation, uh, bracing in valgus position. Um, he had had a prior arthroscopy five years before this time with a partial meniscectomy, uh, a chondroplasty of the trochlea medial femoral and lateral femoral condyle because of uh, mechanical symptoms. And as I talked about, he had the prior PCL reconstruction uh, years ago. So I just said, okay, let's take a look and see what you have. It's sort of a salvage procedure. And this is the trochlea. You can see that there's a significant amount of wear. The, the defect in the trochlea was about a three by four centimeter. On the medial femoral condyle, from zero to 90 degrees, it was three by five. And lateral tibial plateau, or I'm sorry, medial tibial plateau was a, a fairly small lesion, but there was also some meniscal loss. Uh, lateral femoral condyle, there was some mild chondromalacia. And so, for the wayward souls, I decided to take a biopsy. Maybe it would be something to consider. Uh, here's the medial femoral condyle. Uh, there's not much cartilage on this. You can see the amount of meniscus and the probe is back and where the small defect is on the medial tibial plateau. Lateral side, you can see that there's an intact meniscus. And this portion, there's only some mild uh, lateral femoral condyle chondromalacia. So after a long discussion, we decided to do a, a big combination procedure. Uh, you could see he was initially in varus. Uh, he had multiple defects. So here was his medial femoral condyle, trochlea, and lateral femoral condyle lesions. The medial side was so large that I had to sew two sheets together and it was uncontained, so I had to sew it to some of the surrounding edge and uh, put some little um, suture anchors in. Um, in combination with that, on the next slide, you'll see that we did a tubercle osteotomy and a uh, opening wedge tibial osteotomy. So we anteriorized this. I don't think we had to medialize it significantly, but just a straight anteriorization. We also did a lateral lengthening on this. So it's a combination of a Macy of the medial femoral condyle, lateral femoral condyle, trochlea uh, with a combined osteotomy. Uh, and here's the uh, final photos with the uh, correction, which we only had to do a mild correction uh, to get him into neutral alignment. And remember, he's only 33 years, so you don't really want to push him out into the lateral side very much. So next slide. 
uh, this is him pre-op and post-operative. With the osteotomy, he hasn't even needed his hardware out. Uh, there's been no progression of his osteophyte significantly. He still has some uh, medial compartment space, and he, he's actually progressing quite well. In fact, um, I think we uh, rehabbed him very limited because of the large trochlear lesion and also the medial femoral condyle. Uh, so zero to 30 for the first two weeks and then progressively increased it. Uh, what I always do because of problems uh, having done uh, prior ones with periosteum is I have them drop their knee to 90 degrees twice a day. And this is passive and it's so their quadriceps doesn't become stuck basically, and they don't develop adhesions. He was toe-touch weight-bearing because of his double osteotomies. Uh, we started him in physical therapy six weeks out and then progressed him, uh, but we kept him uh, really sedentary for three months. And then one year out, I, let, I made him wait one year before he went back to his regular work as a delivery man carrying 70-pound things and climbing in and out of his truck. Now here's a, a video that if uh, Seth can, let's listen to it if we can. And how much pain do you have when you squat down or perform other activities? Or not so much pain, um, just slight weakness sometimes. Um, feel so much pain. Do you have problems doing a lot of walking? And I know your job requires you to walk and climb stairs a lot. Uh, I mean, I want to hike or something like that. So you can see, and he goes on to talk about what his uh, symptoms are, but he gets symptoms when he goes up hiking mountains. Uh, you know, he's able to be very functional. You can see that he doesn't have a large effusion. And this clearly was a salvage procedure. Um, fortunately, he's done quite well. Uh, he hasn't let me rescope his knee to take a look at things. Um, and just interested in everyone's comments. Well, my comment on uh, an incredible case, uh, not the expected outcome I would have thought. You know, I, I would have thought it might have ended even in this mid and, and you know, what is it, two years now? E even, even worse. Uh, uh, quite an accomplishment to get him to this point. But we're really bad osteoarthritis so you know mike is this um is macy a tool in your arsenal for osteoarthritis i guess would be my question generally not you know i think that uh you know fortunately in in this you know young gentleman he he did he, he had very large lesions but but they were somewhat contained and he had a, a you know a correctable varus deformity um and so and then that, that lateral defect wasn't huge. So you could put a little bit more pressure on that and, and it survived. You know, I'm really impressed that he's, that he's a laborer. You know, that, that's, that, that's uh, pretty impressive too, that he's, he's done so well despite the challenges he puts on that knee. Sandra, let me ask you the opposite way. Is arthroplasty indicated for this guy at 33? Uh, judging with what he's saying, I would say no. Uh, he does have a horrible knee in terms of how much is gone and destroyed, but at 31 or 33, he's not going to be compliant enough to um, not wear out that total knee in like two to three years, you know, or, you know, best case scenario, five to 10. But the reality is his expectations are at a 30-year-old, not at a 50 or 60-year-old. I think my inclination, John, I mean, is to, I, I wouldn't offer this gentleman arthroplasty, but I'd be very scared to offer him cartilage restoration. So I think I'm a tweener. I'd probably use my patient-specific osteotomy and plan like a biplanar, you know, correct coronal, correct his slope, increase it for that PCL, maybe even add that tubercle just because it's right there, breed and see how he did, and then potentially come back, you know, for, for cartilage thing or whatever down the line. But that different strokes for different folks, but a, an amazing case. And thank you for actually following it and getting outcomes to share with us because um, that makes a difference uh, as uh, we all decide what to do for our patients. Um, Banfi, uh, I want to go on, just uh, uh, take us through this one, and then we'll ask a couple of questions and then close. Sure. So, you know, after that last one, I, I, I 
I don't even think this is complex anymore, but uh, this is a 42 year old gentleman <laughs> who, um, you know, originally injured his knee around four years ago playing basketball, had an arthroscopy um, at some outside facility, had a partial medium meniscectomy, but was still struggling. You know, he um, uh, had uh, HA injections, no improvement, was still having pain. His desire was to continue playing sports. Um, these are his x rays. These aren't my typical x rays. So he must have came in uh, with these. Uh, just these standard views. You do see that there's there's some uh, osteophyte formation on that patella, uh, a little bit in the uh, posterior aspect of the tibia, but still preserved joint space. And th these are, are weight bearing films. Merchant views. Uh, and then here is x rays, you know, or excuse me, his MRIs. So on the MRI, you can uh, certainly see that there, there is some wear and tear of his cartilage. He has that osteophyte on the um, uh, medial aspect of his plateau. He also has some significant chondral damage in that, that medial side. He does also have a, a button ossify on that lateral from a condyle that I didn't really appreciate on the x-ray. Um, so we have disease in both, both the medial and lateral compartments with some uh, ossify formation. And then uh, uh, on his exams, he's got full motion, no ligamentous instability, does have some significant crepitus though. Um, but his main complaint is that medial joint line, just after his, his knee scope where they took the, the meniscus out, that's still really where he's complaining about. Um, these are his pictures. So, you know, I thought that his patella actually looked quite good, but he certainly has a very large defect there on his trochlea. Um, you know, it's, it's about three by two centimeters. But again, the, the surrounding cartilage looks okay. Um, then in the, uh, the medial compartment there, you can see he has another large defect, uh, about a, a two by two, maybe two by three centimeter defect with a, a very significantly degenerative uh, medial meniscus. And then in his lateral compartment, I believe the next slide, uh, you can see that, that lateral meniscus is okay, but he, he does have a defect there also. So we want to debris that medial meniscus, perform a chondroplasty. And, you know, at this point, I'm kind of thinking to myself, yeah, this is, you know, not going to be the, the best case for Macy, but I took the biopsy anyways, and, and we, we um, you know, elected to proceed with that. And, and this patient's very educated. He, he, he came into the office, you know, knowing about cartilage restoration, knowing the different options, and was very interested in Macy. So uh, go back one, one slide. So uh, postoperatively, he had, you know, good pain improvement, but he still couldn't return back to the sports he wanted to play, which is basketball and volleyball. So he understood the risk. We, we talked about this at length. We, we had a, a standing alignment films. His alignment was totally neutral. And so we, we elected to proceed with uh, the Macy restoration as well as a, a medial a meniscus transplant. So these are his uh, scope pictures. Again, you can see, I believe before and after with his meniscus there on the, on the top and bottom. And these are his implants in, in both condyles as well as the trochlea. And I remember again, being with the fellow doing this, um, thinking to myself like, gosh, this, what am I doing? I'm not even like teaching the, this fellow the correct indications of surgery at this point. Um, however, you know, uh, he, he did fantastic. I, I typically am, am pretty aggressive with physical therapy but I went slow with him. We just did uh, zero to 20 to protect the, the trochlear graft initially, then zero to 90 for the, the next six weeks. I'm a big believer in BFR. I think that it really uh, prevents um, atrophy of the quadricep. Uh, full weight bearing at uh, the six week mark. And what amazed me about him is, is not only did he progress and not have an infusion, but he also had no crepitus, which still blows my mind today that uh, he was able to do so well. I, I think that you know, unlike the, the uh, kind of patient that goes rogue and does their own rehab, he also was, was very educated. And, and I think that he probably was a really good patient that, that just followed the rules. And, and that's why he's done so well. Sandra, some worry about uh, with meniscus transplant, uh, the, the healing of the transplant and the healing of the Macy, and some might opt to do osteochondral allograft in the compartment of interest. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's what I was kind of worried about when they were put a meniscus in there because of the um, implant. You could potentially, you know, peel it off as you kind of go through range of motion. But if you take the rehab slow, it looks like you might have put a couple sutures in there. Or am I just imagining that? Like, I think I did. Yeah. On, yeah. on the I mean, uncontained I mean, parts. When they're that, yeah. When those lesions are that big, I would probably put some... Um, I would probably put uh, sutures in there too. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think I, I tend to actually do Macy with meniscus transplant. So as opposed to osteochondral grafting. Um, so I, I, I'm kind of more of that school of thought of going that route. 
Yeah, I think that's interesting. And I also think about that, you know, particularly daunting when you have to, you know, hyperflex that knee to get the osteochondral allograft versus working from a window anteriorly with Macy. Uh, it's a lot less stressful uh, to do the, the Macy meniscus transplant route. Um, uh, but certainly you do worry about that delamination. But if you do a great transplant like Mike, the anatomic, uh, and uh, great Macy that's flushed to the bone, then you know they should or they should move well uh, against each other. And so, um, John, any last thoughts on on this uh, case? Uh, I know it was a baby compared to yours, but just want to ask you to shine also. <laughs> yeah, what what I like to do on these, and and I think is so important, is test out the stability of your implant during the surgery. So before I close and everything, I will put the knee through a range of motion because I want to see what's going to happen. Um, on the case I showed, I put it through a full range of motion and the two membranes on the medial femoral condyle just came apart. So then I had to re reset them. And then I put it through a range of motion. And I think on this one with the meniscus and the uh, femoral condyle also, it's important so that you really know what you're going to do when they start moving. Um, so that I think is a critical thing. A lot of people are afraid, oh gosh, I don't wanna move the knee now since I, I put it in there. But that's actually the wrong philosophy. You wanna move it the maximal amount that they might move it. So you're gonna see what's gonna happen. I think one last pearl that comes up, I'm interested in your comments, maybe Mike, uh, as far as you know, any of these salvage joint preservation cases, do you counsel patients about the risk of stiffness, the risk of second looks? Like what percentage do you, you know, that you might be back in there for hardware removal or for some other thing, arthrofibrosis? Like how much, what percentage are you kind of, you know, giving people a number of, you know, within the first two years as part of the, you know, process uh, you might have to return? I think that at the, at the you know, initial discussions of surgery, if we're talking osteotomy, I, I usually will bring up, um, you know, removal of the plate, you know, I, I generally tell people that, you know, some, you know, cause some people, times people just want to remove the plate because they want to remove the plate. But as far as a symptomatic plate, usually in my practice is about 5% of patients. So it's not extremely common. We do discuss it. That's a, a possibility. As far as arthrofibrosis, you know, I probably should discuss it more often. I don't, you know, I usually start talking about that. If I, if I see postoperatively that the patient's very hesitant and then I discuss the fact like, Hey, you know, we had to really take this seriously. You know, if we don't get your range of motion by, you know, X by six weeks or by, you know, Z by 12 weeks, then we're going to have to go back. And that's usually at that, that first, you know, two week follow-up visit. And you know, I think that that ideally will get the message across to have them, you know, focus on their rehab a little bit more. Interesting. That's a great point. Cassandra, any thoughts on, on that? You counsel them pre-op. Uh, when do you get worried? Uh, do you actually, for stiff Macy's, do you uh, go in early and manipulate, or do you go in a little later and scope to breathe and then gently get the motion back under direct visualization? I think I want to say something fairly controversial. I actually, if I start seeing them being a little stiff, um, usually in that four week range, four to five week range, like they're just not quite getting to 90 degrees. And you're like, and you can kind of tell like that body synovitis type feel to it. Um, I'd actually put them on a medjool dose pack. And I know we talked about NSAIDs and theoretic with, with cartilage and chondrocyte growth, but you know, I look at it as like, if you're making that much scar, I want to stop that scar because I don't want to necessarily jump in and scope you this early. So I, you know, that's one of the tricks I use. I haven't really used it that often because I think what Mike was talking about, like the fear of God talk saying like, hey, you got to start moving, usually kicks them into gear. So very uncommonly do I do a scope and kind of debris, but I'm not, you know, I would not jump in and do manipulation. I would definitely scope first really gently and then just slowly kind of get that motion. Um, but a, a lot of times um, when you talk about taking out hardware, patients really want that second look. They're like, I want to see how, what it's looking like. I want to see what's going on. So mm -hmm. I don't feel like it's that hard to say like, hey, there's a second look. They actually like it. I, I also use the Medro dose pack. So I think it's not talked about enough for this and other uh, knee joint preservation. And there's not a tremendous body of literature on it. So maybe we should be you know, publishing on it and looking at it more carefully. Though we don't want stiffness uh, in our patient population. Um, but I think that uh, wraps it up. This was really a, a fun hour. I learned a tremendous amount from all of you. Thanks, John, Mike, and Cassandra for your time. And thanks to Vericell. Um, and uh, certainly uh, a lot of food for thought for our um, you know, patients uh, in our clinics uh, this week. So 
uh, take care and thanks to uh, COA and uh, have a great afternoon or evening. Thanks guys.